All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer, and then we we'll get into our sessions. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again uh, for this beautiful time, this beautiful day, God, where we could just join our hearts together and learn and grow in the things of God. I pray, Holy Spirit, even as we learn about church planting and serving in church, ministering in church, Lord, we pray, God, that you will stir up our hearts, bring revelation, bring new ideas, strategies into our minds, into our hearts, oh God, and uh, prepare us even as we study, God, give us your wisdom, grant us your revelation, that we may understand your word, and, and Lord, that we will Lord, do everything that you have called us to do, Lord. We commit this time into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so last class we looked at chapter 10, uh, the preparation phase, and chapter 11, the launch phase. Right, so we looked at, uh, we've been looking at how to go about planting a local church. Now it's all, most of what we were doing are looking at the practical ways to plant a local church. Uh, now, let's look at chapter 12, strategies for urban evangelism and urban missions. Now, we learned a lot about this in our topic way back in the first years, first semester. Right, uh, we talked about uh, lifestyle evangelism. So, uh, but let's look at a few things that we can think of right now. Again, these are all just guidelines, right? These are strategies that uh, we have put in, but you can come up with your own ideas, uh, things that you would like to do. You can think of it that way, right? So, prior to following the launch, the core team and the local uh, church will have to engage in urban evangelism now why is this important like i always say what you do in the beginning of of any ministry is what will last for a longer time so you instill those values of evangelism instill values of missions right uh, we use the term urban missions, urban evangelism, like interchangeably, meaning they both are very synonymous, yet uh, the methods for both urban evangelism and urban missions may be very different. But how, you, how can you and I, uh, in a day and age that we are living in, uh, uh, in the early 19, I would say 1990s, early 2000s, all the way to maybe about 2010, um, outreaches on the street was, were very, very, very effective. And very effective. Yeah. But we, we see a change. Right? We see a change in the way missions is done. We see a change in the way evangelism is done uh, with the whole introduction of uh, media uh, that's available now. Everything is available on just a touch of a button. Uh, but our methods to share the gospel or in, engage in uh, evangelism or in missions remain the same. The gospel doesn't change because people have changed. The gospel doesn't change because you know we are in our uh, you know we've we've come to the twenty first century. No, the gospel remains constant. Right? The way we communicate the gospel can change over times and seasons. Right? Now, for example, 2030, right? uh, I'm sure the, strategy, the, the method is going to be the same, but the strategies, uh, the, the way to evangelize may be completely different. We don't know. Or it may remain the same. Right? Maybe you never know. Instagram may be a huge part of uh, evangelism. Like, uh, I remember, you know, especially when we were in Mangalore, we had this Instagram page where we would uh, we would just put some pictures or some of our events, and many of them had joined in just by watching Instagram, right? And they've come. People from other faiths have come, and they have become believers. Now we didn't go running searching for them. We didn't go into the streets. We didn't go you know, uh, inviting people, they themselves saw, they themselves came. They believed, their hearts were changed, their lives were changed, 
right? So wholesome methods, three important points in this wholesome methods. We looked at this in uh, lifestyle evangelism as well, but let's just uh, refresh ourselves. First one, being spirit led. Um, in urban missions, in evangelism. Now listen, this is key to doing good ministry. If you and I are going to do ministry in a season that we are in, now remember we are talking to young people, we are talking to a generation that knows a lot, right? They, you know, their their level of thinking is somewhere else. The way they think, the way they grasp things, the way they understand things, it's not like what it was before, right? You know, surprisingly, my little one. He's only nine, but he's using words that are so big, big words, big English words, right? Uh, recently, he just used one word, and I said, who taught you this word? Uh, uh, the word was condescending. He's nine years old. He used the word condescending. And I asked him, what does it mean? And he knew what it means. It's strange. But you look at the level of, you know, it's the same school. Same, you know, the schools that have been running here in our city, but look at the level of understanding, the way they're grasping things. You know, uh, as I was dropping him to school this morning, we were we were driving, and I keep listening to a sermon, and he said, "Play the sermons. I like the sermons." And he was listening to the. We were listening to a sermon on Balaam, and he was understanding everything. So he says, "Okay, so there's a Moabite and an Israelite prophet talking to each other." So he asked me, "What is the Moabites?" You, you see their understanding. So in a time that we are living in, children and the next generation, we cannot give answers that just on the top of our head. We, if we want to touch people's heart, if we want to really penetrate into people's lives, we need to be spirit-led. Because it is the spirit that can touch other people. That's what uh, Hebrews 4.12 is powerful. The Word of God is living, active, alive, powerful, sharper than a double-edged sword. It, it penetrates into our soul, dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Right. So have spirit-led methods. Now, a spirit-led method, the Holy Spirit will give us a method, but we need to implement it. Right. So there's an there's a involvement of you know, the natural as well. The Holy Spirit will give us a plan, a strategy. We have to put it into practice. We have to work towards it. Two, be legal. Do everything in the right way. Three, ethical. Have ethical standards. If you're inviting people to church, let them know it's a church service. Let them know it is uh, the gospel. We're going to be talking about Jesus. Let them know that, you know, don't bring them, invite them to church and they will say, hey, you didn't tell me it's a church. You didn't tell me people are going to be talking about the Bible. Now that's offensive. That's not being ethical, right? So when, when we are ministering to people, let them know. The mistake we may make is try to cover it up just to win a soul. And that's the wrong thing to do, right? Be ethical. As we go out, we become all things to all of them. We step into their world, we go where they are, we relate and identify with them while remaining obedient to Christ in order to reach them. You get what's happening here? We become all things, meaning we, we step into their world. We step into, we try to relate to them, we try to understand them. Now, let me give you an example. If somebody comes up to me and says, a youth, for example, you know, recently uh, I've been speaking to a young man, early 20s, maybe 23, 24 years old. And he came up to me and he said, he said, you know, I'm feeling suicidal. Now, for me, it's very difficult to understand this personally, right? For me. Because for me, no matter what the problem is, ending the life is not the solution. You have to overcome. And we have to move on. And being believers, we have been given authority. For me, it's like that. But I don't know what they are going through. Right? I don't know what is happening in their life. So I must be able to relate to him, try to understand him. Where is he coming from? What is his 
step into his world. Right. Now, for me, I had probably you know, I had good parents. Parents looked after me, you know, beautiful family. I don't know what happened to him. He may have gone through a terrible uh, upbringing, right? Uh, maybe no parents, maybe no love of the parents, and he's eagerly yearning for that. Or maybe he was not encouraged when he was small. So I don't know, but I need to step into what he's to what he's going through. Yet I be obedient to Christ, meaning I say, see, whatever you're going through, whatever problems that you're going through, whatever challenges, whatever you know uh, is happening in your mind, I got to be obedient to what God is telling me. So I share the gospel. I minister to this person uh, with the hope that God will change his, you know, change his life. Uh, the Holy Spirit will penetrate into his life and speak to him. Then I've got people who sometimes people come up to us and say, you know, uh, oh, I feel that I'm gay. So I feel I have feelings for other guys being a boy. When I look at other girls, I don't feel anything. But when I look at guys, I feel that I feel attracted to them. Now, is that right or wrong? That's wrong, right? Uh, but I must step into their world. I need to. It's very easy to point finger and say, hey, this is wrong. Thus says the Lord. Uh, Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3. You know, God is speaking of this. You know, even in the Old Testament, they committed, you know, terrible sins. One of them being this immorality. Um, how can you do this? It's very easy to point fingers, but I must be able to step into their world, try to understand what he's going through. Maybe. This, you know, I was speaking to a young man many years back, maybe about 10, more than 10 years back, and he said he's attracted to men because growing up, his father was never there with him. And so he had this feeling of, and it was not his same age, when he looked at men who were 10, 15 years elder, he was attracted to them. That was strange. It may sound strange for me, but I need to step into their world. Yet I be obedient. I say, see, I understand what you're going through. I understand that all of this is happening. Yet, I, when I journey along with them, I bring out the truth of God's word. Get what I'm saying, right? So be culturally sensitive, be culturally relevant as well. What works in one place may not work in another place. And we learn about this. Now, look at this question. What hinders us from stepping into people's world? What, what do you think hinders us? Why, why do we stop from stepping into others' world? You know. Sometimes ignorance, sometimes fear. Yes, very true. Any other thoughts? What, why do you think we, you know, we hold back from stepping into... Cultural differences, yes. Practical thing. Languages could be another uh, issue. So these are all right. But one of one important point that we can also uh, bring out is sometimes we, when we are ministering, we feel that hey, if I share or I step into their world, I may offend them. I may say something that they may not be happy to hear. Right. Of course, all the other practical reasons as well. Or, you know, inhibitions like, what if they get upset with me? What if they are angry if I share the gospel with them? Or, you know, they may not listen. They've been people from other faiths for 30 years. So we have all these reasonings in our mind. Yet, we need to step into their world. A perfect example would be Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Right. Beautifully, so beautifully, he stepped into her world. That woman, you are thirsty, but I'm going to give you water that when you drink that, you'll thirst no more. And she says, what kind of water is this? And she never understood that, you know, married to five people, the one who's who you're living with, is not even your husband. Thirsty, seeking, loneliness, 
pain that she's going through, Jesus steps in and says, listen, I know where you're coming from. I'm going to give you water that once you drink it, you will never thirst again. Right? So we minister, sorry, we seek not to intentionally offend people, but minister in such a way as to draw them to Christ. Let's read that passage, 1 Corinthians 10, 31 through 33. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 to 33. Go ahead. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Mm. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, yep. that they may be saved. Yes. So Paul is writing here. So, so whether you eat or drink, meaning whatever you do, don't seek to offend people. Example, basically what Paul is trying to say is, if you're sitting with Gentiles and you have to eat chicken, eat if you're sitting with or if you're sitting with vegetarians, if you have to eat vegetables, sit and eat that. Don't try to offend them because of who are or who we are, right? So Paul is basically saying, be what you are, who you are to the people around you. Don't offend people. Minister in such a way that your life will bring people to Christ. You know. There's this beautiful allegory. It's a beautiful story that I just recently read. You know, the Bible says we are the salt of the earth, right? And as so if you look at the salt bottle, you've seen a salt shaker, right? So it's like all those little salts are believers, right? So there's salt, all of them in the salt bottle. All the believers are all close together, having good communion with each other, talking to each other. But then one of the salt members says, listen, you all are so happy. One day, they're going to make a big bowl of soup. You see that bowl of soup they're boiling there? Yes. So one day, this, this person is going to take us and put some of that salt into the soup. And then we will never see them again. We will never see our brothers and sisters again. Right? And so then they start getting worried. Oh, I don't want to go into that hot bowl of soup. And eventually, another brother stands up and says, listen, all that is true. When they pour out the salt, some of our brothers and sisters have gone, and they've gone into the soup, and we've never seen them again. But one thing I know, when we get into that soup, the taste of the soup will be changed. It will not be the same. Now, this is just an uh, allegory. Uh, uh, an exaggeration of a story. But the point is, you and I as salt are called to impact the places that we go to. And salt gets into that soup. No matter how, you know, no matter how many vegetables or, uh, or whatever you put in that soup, you make it look so beautiful and, and you're all so hungry. And they bring that bowl of soup in front of you and there's no salt in it. What are you going to do? You'll be so upset. You'll say, hey, there's no salt in this. Oh, but it looks good. It's got all the vegetables. It's got all the healthy food in it. Nice and hot. It's good to drink it. Good for your body. There's no salt in it. If the salt loses its saltiness, it is of no use but to be trampled upon. So... Very, very beautiful example of how you and I, being salt, are called to impact the places that we go to. That's what Paul is trying to say. Don't let things like food and, and uh, clothing or culture or language bring a division among us, right? We do ministry in a way there is no opportunity to blame. So again, Second Corinthians 6, 3 and 4. Let's read that. 2 Corinthians 6, 3 and 4. 3 and 4. 
we give no offense to anything but that our ministry may not be blamed but in all things we command ourselves as ministers of god in much patience in tribulations in needs in distresses yes the version which i have says we put no stumbling block in anyone's path that our ministry will not be discredited paul is saying that see he's saying we put no stumbling block in anyone's path that means we are not trying to uh, trap people in any way we are not trying to make people fall we are not putting a stumbling block in their path but what we are doing is we are doing ministry in a way that nobody can blame us and did paul do this in his life he did right well, i can give you a couple of examples uh, all through in his missionary journeys he said in one place he said he has to go to jerusalem so he tells the church see listen even as i'm going i'm taking the offering the contribution that you have given to go give to jerusalem i'm not going alone i'm taking i think he takes epaphras epaphroditus and goes along i could be wrong epaphroditus and timothy i guess so he goes as a team the point is he doesn't go alone he didn't want that to be a stumbling block word of paul on the way use some of the funds that was given as a contribution to the church in jerusalem so i don't want any stumbling block i don't want anyone talking about the ministry so i will make a team all three of us will go and give the money to jerusalem uh, clarity being clear and paul made sure that his ministry he goes on even even all through uh, even towards the end of his life he says i worked i stayed in a rented house i paid my own rent and i didn't depend on anyone even though as an apostle i could have depended on you i have the right of an apostle to ask but i never asked you right because i didn't want it to be a stumbling block in my ministry so god has commissioned us to preach uh, so we share jesus christ even if we are told not to but we must ensure that not, we are not violating the law of the land now here's something interesting you know last week we had our last sunday we had uh, gideon's ministry those of you who don't know gideon's is uh, uh, ministry has been uh, doing a, a beautiful ministry mostly using their bibles to reach out to uh, people all across india mostly and even the world so normally during the early days wherever you go to a hotel you'll find a gideon's bible um so gideon's were always doing that so they had their stall at uh, apc uh, on sunday and uh, you know those who work with gideon's they were they were sharing with me you know, and as we were engaging and talking they said those there are certain places where in india this ministry has given been given permission to hand out bibles right so they go through a certain course and they're given a, like a small badge right, saying that you are part of the Gideon ministry. And there are certain places that the government of India has approved Gideon's ministry to hand out Bibles. Right? Now, it's not like they go and give out the Bibles to people, but they're, you know, they can make a stand. They can um, uh, probably a kiosk. A, a table and there they can give out bibles so if people come and say you can't do this you can always say hey i have this badge this is given by the government of india and they said that in this place these places i can give out bibles i'm not coercing i'm not forcing anyone but it's just there if they'd like they can come and take so what are they doing and and even we must you know follow these things we a commission to preach, a commission to minister to people, but we follow the law of the land. Right? Example, uh, Christmas season, this coming Christmas, we have got a couple of opportunities all across uh, embassy groups, is IT, IT parks, uh, and we're going to be doing carols and uh, sharing of the word of God for about 10 minutes. We'll have our book tables, all of it. Now, with all of this, we have taken permission Right? And later on, I'll have to go to get permission from the police stations as well, the closest police station in that jurisdiction, so that 
when we are doing this, it it would it won't affect it won't affect APC as a ministry. It won't affect uh, what we are doing, right? Uh, so, God has commissioned us to preach. We must ensure we preach and not uh, disobey the law of the land, right? Now, even as we go about doing these urban missions, urban evangelism, identify identify and develop strategies for different areas now there are here look at these five areas one for different age groups so you have children up to the age of 18 then you have the 10 14 window so some things that we do is the catalyst now this catalyst ministry is really powerful because think of this you've got children who are maybe from third standard all the way up to 10th standard in school now people are coming from other faiths and they're sitting there and we as a catalyst ministry are going in directly into the schools with permission with approvals and sharing the word of god what is happening they're sowing seeds they're going to many many schools all across bangalore that's a powerful thing because when they grow up, right? Now, I'm not saying that they become believers and accept the Lord Jesus. If they do, that's good. But the seeds have been sown, right, in, in their heart. So now I can't go to Catalyst Ministry and start talking about end times and Bible prophecy. Will it make sense? I can't go to Catalyst and start speaking about the different old covenants that are that God established. Contrasted with the new covenant, so no use, right? right? We got to think. So, minister at the level of where they are. So, I come up with some simple points, simple biblical principles. Come up with a story, and grasp their attention. And we learned this in homiletics, right? Um, and even ministry of the evangelist, pastor, and teacher. In the ministry of the teacher, he must be able to capture the audience. Right? And Jesus did it so beautifully. Imagine thousands of people are sitting and listening to him. Some of them are dozing off probably. But then suddenly he says, let me tell you a parable. Everyone's eyes are open. Oh, we love stories. Everyone loves the story. So that he knew how to capture his audience. And so even as we minister, especially to children, we must... Be able to capture them, Cap capture what you know. Try to relate to them. Then we have youth, ages eighteen to twenty-five. This is a huge margin, huge group of you know, millions of people. And what is encouraging is nowadays we have social media and a lot of these platforms like you know to connect with people you have whatsapp you can you can do zoom calls you can have a zoom meetings you can have prayers online you can you know, of course life groups and um, uh, missions and so much that we can do right so youth how do i how do i minister to them just a few questions what are their aspirations what do youth want to be look at a time that we are living in you know I was reading an article written by uh, the Times of India, and one of the things mentioned was youth nowadays are not, okay, not, not everyone, but a certain percentage of youth are not looking for high salaries. They're not looking only for that. Youth nowadays are looking for peace of mind. They're okay to work small jobs. Youth nowadays, many of them want to go out of the city. Want some silence, right? Uh, and I was reading an article where many, many youth from Bangalore are deciding to move out of the city, going outskirts of the city. And now, with the whole work from home, people are going away more and more. And recently, yesterday, I was reading again in the news that with the Bangalore Mysore Expressway, which is just a one hour commute, people are getting jobs in, Mang in Mysore, but they live in Bangalore. Bangalore, sorry. So two or three days in a week, they go all the way to Mysore, attend the office, come back. 
one one and a half hours journey or, or two hours journey to Mysore. It's okay. Here in Bangalore also it takes two to three hours to reach one end of the uh, or one end of the city. So what are their what are their aspirations? What you know, it's not only about money making nowadays. And youth are searching. What are their apprehensions? What strategies can we develop to reach youth in urban missions? What are the strategies that we can develop? Right? So look at this Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, Gen Alpha. We are at the Gen Alpha stage, right? Uh, then Gen Beta. And uh, remember, see, as believers, we must not be intimidated by what the enemy is doing. Right? Don't be intimidated by our youth. Youth will have many things in their mind, right? They may come up with strange ideologies, strange uh, doctrines that we may not even understand or may not even have heard of. That's okay. Don't be intimidated. That's why I love the gospel. That's why I love what Paul says. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And it's going to be the power of God unto salvation even during the tribulation period. So that will not change right so yes there will be new generations coming up there will be new ideologies uh, new ways of you know people youth thinking and the way they behave but the gospel does not change our strategies we work towards that right so you can have seminars coffee talks youth concerts campus groups um, come up with you know, Chira, I think, has been doing some things with the youth, right? Uh, getting all the youth together from different churches, uh, you know, getting all the youth together and then having a concert, get, inviting people, bringing people to Christ. Music. Anyone loves a good concert. Anyone loves to be part of a worship evening. Right? Um, and so you come up, you see what works for you in your... No, I can't expect Chira to go to a village and say youth concert. Nobody's going to come for youth concert, right? So it's we need to think how we are doing the ministry, right? So young adults, married families, senior citizens, address their needs, right? Uh, again, addressing areas of needs. People coming into the city, maybe for education uh, and the problems in the city, suicide. It's strange that a city like Bangalore has so much of prospects. Don't you feel so? Right? Think about this. I always feel that if people come from, when people come from different cities, not only Bangalore, but since Bangalore is a Taiwan city, if they come into the city, there are plenty of opportunities. Right? You can make a living somehow, you know, work, IT parks, IT and uh, small offices, big offices, there are opportunities, many, many opportunities, right? But can you believe that in a city like ours that boasts to be the ID capital, people earning, you know, in, in lakhs, huge amounts of money, yet Bangalore is the suicide capital of India. Have you ever thought of it? Everyone say, oh, Bangalore's weather is the best weather that we've ever seen. It's a suicide capital. People don't want to live. I, I, and I find it very strange. You look at the enemy. He, he brings in these things. And that's where the church needs to step in. Right? The church should advance to the gates of hell. Right? We go to the gates. Right? And, and we ask God, God, give us ideas, give us solutions, give us strategies. How are we going to do this? Right? Then drug addictions, people seeking jobs, financial guidance, homeless people, slums, prisons. Uh, so be careful that good intentions and actions are not misunderstood. Now, this is important, meaning... When you are doing these ministries, you may need to partner with other ministries, partner with other 
pastors and leaders in the city or across the city. Be careful and be wise how you do your ministry. Right? Step into areas only where God has called you to. Don't step into areas when you know that God has not called you to that area. So again, you address these needs. Thirdly, strategies addressing different spheres of activity. Now we've heard of the seven mountain, uh, seven mountains or seven spheres of influence that we call it. Education, arts and entertainment, media, business, government, family and religion. Now these seven encompass almost every area of life uh, in, uh, of a human being. So if, whatever we do, we are in one of these seven spheres of influence, right? So we, how do we reach the influential? Uh, we need to be skilled and qualified to reach out. Now, for example, if I have to reach somebody in arts and entertainment, I must know something about it, right? And that's why we have the conference coming up, right? Um, a conference on song detailing and filmmaking. So we learn how can I, as a filmmaker, be able to, you know, be salt in the place that I am. Let me tell you, I was reading this article. Uh, I don't know why I keep saying this, but uh, you know, every time I don't make these notes, you know, I just keep thinking of it. Just comes to my mind. The article on the Passion of the Christ and uh, you know Mel Gibson, we know that he was the director of it, and uh, but he talks about the oppositions that people had against him doing this. Do you know that initially he was crowdfunded, meaning people he had to ask people for money because no big label was willing to, you know, get him to do this. The passion of the Christ he said, "No, we're not helping you out in this." And and so he was crowdfunded. Whatever he had, he sold some of his belongings just to get things started for this movie. And he was writing about people used to ask him, "You know, you as a person are going through all of these things, drug addictions and alcoholic, and why do you want to do this?" And his response was. As a filmmaker, as a producer, as a director, as an actor, I may not be a person who Christ wants me to be, but at least I can get people to know who the Christ is. I'm on my journey to know who Christ is, but I can get people to know who Christ is. Right? And there's so much of oppression, so much of so many challenges that he went through. And you know, interestingly, after the entire movie, many of them became believers during the filming of the movie. Right? And he 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 himself says that, you know, just watching their lives change brought him so much joy that, you know, after the movie was released, it hit the box office and did really well. He made a about a uh, you know, I think it was about a hundred crore, hundred hundred and fifty crore profit. Uh, apart from what he spent, I think it was more than that. But he made a huge amount of profit out of it. He said, "All of that money, the profit that I made, is not as valuable as, as seeing lives that were touched. Lives changed. I didn't preach to them. I didn't get the Bible there and start preaching. This is what Jesus did. But God Himself changed people's lives." And so he started, you know, he, he writes and he says that we can be influential, we can be the salt wherever we are doing what we're doing. Listen, there are and there's a writer who says this: there are five gospels: Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and a Christian. Sometimes people will not read the first four gospels. Meaning, they'll read only you. We'll read only me. And it's our responsibility to point Jesus to Christ, point people to Jesus Christ. Right? So we 
here there's an, another example bible studies for people in the armed forces i remember this we we have uh, i think this is 2011 we had one of our church members who was uh, in the armed forces and we would go and uh, do a little bit of a bible study there for about half an hour uh, bible study worship and then close in 45 minutes and then they would have their programs right uh, so we 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 look for new ways of ministry and encourage it right then strategies leveraging available tools so tools that we have right television print internet music performing arts now we just come up with short movies right the recent one that uh, we came up with at abc uh, short sorry what is it engagement right attachment attachment sorry yes attachment uh so small movies now think of this think about like for me example right if somebody sends me a video i will watch the first two minutes not even two minutes the first minute of 40 seconds to one minute if it doesn't if it doesn't catch my attention i, I will just maybe skip it but unless i know it's like a sermon or it's a you know something to do with the word of god then i may I, then i will definitely listen to the whole thing but if some random thing i'm not going to listen to it right um so you we need to be careful and we need to understand okay i have to capture this person's attention in 30 seconds you have 30 seconds time what can i do what can i say right uh oh, what can i what can i share with this person so uh, these are many different ways that you can minister. Right? Uh, maybe short videos, short, short uh, images, or short you know, uh, uh, reels that may be available. Whatever is available, prayerfully uh, share it. Uh, and even as you do that, follow regulations, guidelines, um, and, and trust God to work through them. Right? So we'll take a break. We'll we'll come back at ten o'clock, and then we will uh, pick up from chapter thirteen. Let's take a break.